Welcome. President of the General Assembly, who will shortly be arriving, Deputy Secretary General Same, Excellencies, distinguished panelists, colleagues, and guests, I welcome you this evening. I would particularly like to thank His Excellency, Mr. Vincent Brada, Minister of the Environment of Rwanda, and Her Excellency, Ms. Catherine McKenna, Minister of Environment and Climate Change for Canada, for their dedication to the organization of this panel. They have been instrumental in acting as the driving force behind this important and timely event. I'm delighted that we're gathered this evening as we look ahead toward the ratification and implementation of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. This amendment will help avoid up to 0.5 degrees Celsius of global warming by phasing down the use of HFCs. The Cassandra metaphor of ancient Greek mythology raises a paradoxical dilemma relevant perhaps to our discussion today. According to the tale, the god Apollo granted the beautiful Cassandra with the ability to foretell the future, but with the caveat that no one would ever heed her predictions. Environmental science has suggested with great confidence that climate change is a fast developing process with serious imminent implications for the global community. Data on climate change has clearly marked the thinning of the Arctic ice caps, a rise in global temperatures, and deforestation of major rainforests. Nevertheless, data on climate change has not always been treated with the appropriate urgency and action. The Kigali Amendment could be a promising step toward heeding what science has foretold. It is now generally recognized that the use of HFCs also presents significant environment challenges. The amount of HFCs being used is the equivalent to the emissions from nearly 300 coal-fired power plants and is a significant contributor to global warming. Following seven years of continued discussions, parties to the Montreal Protocol established a deal that mandated reduction of HFC use. The establishment of such a historic agreement is a testament to the hard work, dedication, and passion of all those involved. As we continue to harness this passion, we must now focus our attention to the execution of the deal. That is, to ensure that ratification is achieved and implementation is successful. In 1930, to help achieve social change in India, Mohandas Gandhi decided to walk 240 miles to the coast. It took him two months, and along the way, he gathered more and more people who shared his vision. When thinking about large-scale issues, it's easy to become overwhelmed by their enormity. I encourage you to keep in mind that every social change begins with one conversation, and every journey begins with one step. Protecting our environment remains a major global issue and requires the continued effort of all parties. The ratification of the Kigali Amendment is a single but significant step toward the larger task of effecting positive change. Dividing up this process into small manageable steps will be important for achieving broader goals. The success of this process will signal a major step in the direction toward effective action against climate change and the Montreal Protocol's adaptation to further the impact of changes already in action. Every panelist here is committed to ensuring the Kigali Amendment enters into force and that implementation will move ahead as planned. We will begin the event by hearing from His Excellency Mr. Vincent Barada, Republic of Rwanda's Minister of Environment. Thank you. Catherine McKenna, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Canada. John Silk, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Marshall Islands. Nicolas Hulot, Minister, Minister for Ecological and Inclusive Transition, France. Dr. Edgar Gutierrez, Minister of Environment and Energy, Costa Rica, and President of the 2017 UN Environment Assembly. 
John Burkett, Assistant Secretary General and Ombudsman of the United Nations, Eric Solem, Executive Director, UN Environment Program, Ashim Steiner, Administrator, UN Development Program, Dr. Tina Binpili, Executive Secretary, UN Ozone Secretariat, colleague ministers here present, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this special event on the ratification of the Chigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. We have come together to restate our commitment to the Chigali Amendment and to encourage quick ratification. In doing so, we send a strong signal that the world is united in ending the use of hydrofluorocarbons and protecting our climate. I would like to begin by acknowledging the five countries that have already ratified in addition to Rwanda. My thanks go to the leaders and people of Mali, the Federated State of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, Palau, and Norway. I wish to also extend my appreciation to Canada, the European Union, and the UK for beginning the process, and Sweden and Chile for encouraging parties to ratify. I also encourage all those who have made big strides towards the ratification to continue this good work. The collective commitment already shown gives me great hope for the success of the Chigari Amendment and the phase down of, hydro, of the hydrofluorocarbons. The spirit of the Montreal Protocol, one of collaboration and solidarity, was felt around the world when we passed the Chigari Amendment in the early hours of the morning on October 15th last year. Now the challenge is to keep that momentum going. We must work together so that the amendment enters into force on 1st January 2019. And to achieve this, we need parties to follow the lead of those who have already ratified. I have no doubt that more early ratifications will create the same kind of positive momentum we saw with the Paris Agreement and encourage other nations to follow suit. As we all know, implementation of the amendment will avoid up to half a degree Celsius of warming by the end of the century. Paired with energy efficiency measures, the benefit could double to one degree. I can't underscore just how important such a result is for addressing climate change and achieving the Paris Agreement targets. Quick ratification also has benefits for individual member states, including extra financial support dedicated to enabling activities for developing countries. I encourage all Article 5 parties to take advantage of this and begin the transition away from HFCs. I also call on our partners to play their part by supporting a strong replenishment of the multilateral fund. These are just a few reasons why quick ratification and implementation of the Chigari Amendment makes sense for addressing climate change and supporting the sustainable development goals. We owe this not only to future generations who will face the worst impacts of climate change, but also to those already dealing with the devastating challenges of a warming planet. I wish to conclude by thanking Eric, Tina, and the whole team of at the UN Environment and the Ozone Secretariat for their continued hard work to support nations to ratify. I would also like to express my gratitude to Minister McKenna for her leadership on advancing the Montreal Protocol and the Chigari Amendment. We are looking forward to the 29th meeting of the parties to the Montreal Protocol in Canada in November and I am hopeful that by then, at least 20 parties will have completed the ratification process. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. And turn to Ms. Catherine McKenna, Her Excellency Catherine McKenna, Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Canada. I will thank you. You'd think I'd get this by now. 
Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Johnson. Um, thank you to my great friend uh, and partner in this, uh, Vincent, um, to uh, Your Excellencies, honored guests, and all of our supporters here. Um, I'm going to start by telling a story, a um, story of when I was a child. Uh, I remember hearing about this hole in the ozone layer. And I remember thinking, wow, like, this is terrible. Are we going to be able to survive? And what are people going to do about it? What are world leaders going to do about it? And this is a good news story because the ozone hole is well on its way to being repaired. Uh, and that's because leaders came together. They said, we need to step up. We need to take action. We need to protect human health. Um, we knew that there, uh, that, uh, that skin cancer was a huge issue. Uh, we probably didn't recognize how important the, the step was going to be with the Montreal Protocol um, to reduce um, emissions. Um, but it was an amazing achievement. And it was an achievement that uh, was successful because there was good science, um, there was partnership with industry, and there was innovation, and there was leadership. And this is all about stepping up and showing leadership. And so I really do want to thank all of you in the room that are really saying that you're going to step up. For those of you who have ratified, I, I wish we were there on the list. I hate, I'm very competitive, so I hate not being on this list. Um, but it takes, there's a, a bit of time um, in, in Canada to do this. But to Mali, Micronesia, Marshall Islands, Rwanda, Norway, and Palau, thank you very much. You need people, you need countries that are going to step up and, and show leadership, and you have done that. And I was just doing a list because I said, okay, can you give me a list of all the countries that are in the process of ratifying the amendment? And if you include Canada, uh, we come to 20. Uh, but we want more. Uh, we want to, uh, we want, uh, to reach uh, the, the magic number of 20. Um, but we also want to go beyond that because only good, good things only happen if we do this together. I say this over and over. Uh, some people need to be dragged kicking and screaming, and some people are at the High Ambition Coalition, John. Um, but uh, I think that um, this is really an opportunity. Um, I, I look around the room, so uh, I saw many of you in Montreal. You can tell all your colleagues that if they, you know, if they are able to ratify, they're very welcome in Montreal. Um, they're probably welcome anyway, but uh, we had a nice time with, with ministers um, uh, just this past weekend. Um, but the link between the, the ratification of the, um, uh, uh, of the Kingali Amendment uh, as Vincent spoke about, it's, it's it, it half a degree or more um, in in uh, global warming that we can we can stop. And given that we know that we need to be well below two degrees, that makes a huge difference. Um, there's also the financial support that was part uh, that was that is that is with the amendment, um, and also the economic opportunity. Um, I don't know how many of you were in the negotiations. I think back to the negotiations. Uh, and uh, I met many of you there in Vienna. And someone had a funny comment. So we have to liven up these meetings a bit. Someone said, you know, people in the Montreal Protocol, the negotiators are much better. You know, they're very fate based on kind of facts and science. And they move forward. And now it's been ruined by all the, the Paris Agreement negotiators. And I was thinking, oh, that's, that's me. Because uh, we confuse it. We kind of like make this big negotiation. But uh, I was very pleased that, that from um, Vienna we went on. Uh, to Kigali, and Vincent, your leadership in that of Rwanda was incredible. And I really do want to recognize this, that I think it's also partnerships from between developed countries and less developed countries working together to do big things uh, is extraordinarily um, important. So I will end by just saying that uh, we need to get this done. Um, so we're coming to Montreal uh, this November uh, to host a meeting of the parties. And if everyone just asks one friend, pick your favorite uh, other minister of the environment, and just pair up with them and just encourage them uh, to, uh, to ratify, uh, we will be able to have a great celebration because uh, we will have the Montreal Protocol coming into force. Um, and just a reminder, I always think about this, um, at the end it's just about our kids. Uh, so we have a real opportunity to do something important. Um, it's hard. It's hard to get things through get parliaments. And, you know, there's reasons why you can't do it. But let's try to figure out the reasons we can and just push through that and get it done. Thank you very much.
very much. We will turn to the rest of the panel. Just so you know, we are expecting uh, to drop in the Deputy Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly, and when we do, we will give them the floor so that they can speak before they move on to other engagements. Uh, <clears throat> I would now like to turn over to Dr. His, His Excellency, Dr. Edgar Guterres, Minister of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica and President of the 2017 UN Environment Assembly. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Rwanda and Canada, for taking the lead on, on this, and, and happy to everybody for, be, for celebrating the 30th anniversary of the, um, of the Montreal Protocol and, and, and this milestone, because we have, a, we have accomplished a lot of things. I mean, before coming to the negotiations of uh, the Paris Agreement, we said, well, you know, we, 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 we succeeded with Montreal Protocol. Then there is a hope, a multilateralism show that there is a hope also with the Paris Agreement. With this protocol, we have um, protect the ozone layer, uh, facing out about 99% of, of the harmful ozone-depleting substances. We have protected life under the sun, including human health, protecting ecosystems and food chains, promoting a greener economy and contributing to capacity development and conversion to green industry through the multilateral fund. We have to protect the global climate. And also, there is one issue that is very important. We are still promoting an inclusive approach with engagement of all key stakeholders in the process. I think these are milestones of, the, of this process that um, that uh, shows show to all, everybody that this is actually a very good success and, and, and a very good showcase of, of, of being hopeful that we humans can do good things in this planet. I just want to tell you that I, this morning I spoke to um, the chairperson that leads the International Commission in my Congress, in the Congress of Costa Rica, and ask him to, to put the ratification of the amendment uh, on the table and already fix a meeting next Thursday to receive our representatives from the ministry in order for them to learn about this thing. And he pro promised me that we are going to be one of those 20 that you were mentioning. Hopefully, you know. The executive, the, the, executive, the executive branch is one thing, and the legislative branch is another one. So <laughs> sometimes we don't know how to guess well the outcomes. Uh, now with my head of uh, president of the United Nations Environment Assembly, as you know, the, the United Nations Environment Assembly is, um, has become one of the universal bodies that takes care of the environmental agenda of the Agenda 2030. Uh, we are going to meet in Nairobi um, uh, this coming December, early December, and I'm going to make sure to convey a message as well to all ministers of environment, 193 ministers of environment, that, um, and encourage them to ratify the amendment. It's going to be there and it's, uh, we're going to make sure, and you're going to be there as well. So we're going to make sure that this this message is going to be strong, so that uh, we can have more countries to to ratify the the amendment. Um, the phase out of of um, HFSCs, which will contribute directly towards the SDG 13, will take place within the existing framework and mechanism of the Montreal Protocol. Key among these are financial support, as Minister Biruta was saying, to developing countries, a robust non-compliance mechanism, assessment panels providing regular updates on scientific, technical, economic, and environmental issues, and exception mechanism to provide for essential uses of substances until, until the alternative can be found and trade restrictions. Using the existing framework, 
ensures effective implementation at minimal extra-organizational cost, which is a strong incentive towards ratification. So let's hope that we accomplish this task before December, and let's, uh, let's have our nations to rat ratify the amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We turn now to Mr. His Excellency, Mr. Nicholas Hulot, Minister for Ecological and Inclusive Transition in, from France. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, ministers, directors, administrators, friends, Sometimes I tell myself that in this complex world, to keep hope, to maintain hope, is an act of courage. But there are some good news, however. And this is part of the good news items. And when we're together, nothing's impossible, as we've seen. This year, we're marking the 30th anniversary of the Montreal Protocol. True, it's one of the great achievements of the international community in the area of protecting our environment. And it gives us some hope regarding the Paris Accord. Obviously, it's all due to collective efforts, which make both developed and developing countries work together. And this is remarkable. And it's almost certain that in the 30 years to come, the ozone law will be fully repaired. For the climate general, in general, it will be longer and more complex, though. But when we work together, as I said, we can achieve a lot. And it applies also to the Paris Accord. Thanks to the mobilization, Rwanda, you deserve particular praise. Thanks to you, we've crossed a major threshold at the time when the Kigali Amendment on HFCs was adopted, which is a great addition to the Paris Accord. It shows once again the high quality of the Montreal Protocol, which shows that we can at the same time protect the ozone layer and work against climate change. A year after the negotiations, time has come for action. And both Rwanda and Canada have emphasized that. And thank you, by the way, for the invitation to speak here. As regards France, we are going to try very hard in this area, as in others, to implement this amendment to prohibit the use of HFCs. When the amendment was adopted, we started the process of ratification right away. And I can tell you that the ratification law will be submitted to our Council of Ministers on the 27th of September by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But it's not enough to just ratify the amendment. It will be a contribution, but I've included in the climate plan, which I presented some time ago, a project to impose HFC tax to encourage all industries to look for less polluting options, less polluting solutions. This tax is an extension of carbon price, and it will be in effect since 2018. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. We now turn to the Honorable John Silk, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Marshall Islands. Thank you, uh, Chair. <clears throat> Excellencies, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> thank you to Canada and Rwanda for conveying us here today. The, the, the Kikali Amendment would not exist without your leadership and that, the, and that of islands like Micronesia, which introduced and championed its idea for many years. It is in, it is in fact 
perhaps one of the greatest examples of island leadership we have seen in quite a while. At the end of a long night of negotiations uh, in Gikali last year, the late minister, Zacharias, uh, said it would be a proud call home to his kids that night. He said that because he knew the, the, the Kikali Amendment could mean the difference between whether our country and their future would exist or not. Unless every country and every sector takes action, it will be impossible to keep global temperatures increases below 1.5 degrees. While we are still a long way off track, this amendment is the single biggest shot towards us doing so. In March, the Marshall Islands became the first country to complete its domestic ratification of the amendment. <clears throat> and in May, we deposited it with the UN just a, just a few days after our Micronesian brothers and sisters did the same. While Palau's, with Palau's deposit earlier this month, the Northern Pacific is now the first region in the world to have completed its ratification of the Kikali Amendment. As we have heard, we only need 20 countries for the amendment to come into a force in 2019. We can achieve this, and we must. Those, these 20 ratifications this year. We must achieve these 20 ratifications this year. Doing so would be a strong demonstration of our commitment to the amendment and to the multilateralism as a whole in the current geopolitical context. It would also send an important market signal that from 1st January 2019, this amendment will be the law of the land. And we are eager to continue to play a leadership role and encourage others to do the same. We cannot lose sight of the fact that many countries will need to support implement the implementation, to, to need to support, need support to implement this amendment. The KCLEP funding last year was particularly welcome in this regard, as we are we we as were pledged by governments. It will be especially important that we work constructively towards the replenishment of the multilateral fund this year. We also cannot lose sight that we all need to do more and to do more faster. The, the Kikali Amendment is not perfect, and a number of countries said at the end of the meeting in Kikali that they would be eager to move more quickly if they could. We need to find a way to build on the amendment over time. Finally, energy efficiency will also be key. I am told that this could help wipe off another 0 0.5 degrees of predict predicted temperature increases before the end of the century. If it did, then this would go a long way to helping my country survive and honoring the legacy of Minister Zacharias, who fought so hard for this amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I would now like to turn over to the Executive Director of UN Environment, Mr. Eric Solheim. Thank, thank you so much. And while we have a lot of hard work ahead of us, I think we should also take some time to celebrate because Montreal Protocol is not only the most successful environment treaty ever on planet Earth, it's probably the most successful treaty of any kind. Peace, trade, environment, development. I'm not aware of any other agreement we have come together and made, implemented to 100% by everyone. And then we see the practical results. The ozone layer is coming back. So let's take two seconds just to reflect upon why it has been so successful. 
because this is really the textbook example on what we need to do on climate, but on so many other global issues. Number one, we got the science right. Some scientists in the United States and Mexico did ring the alarm bell in the 1970s. At the time, they were claimed that they were scaremongers. And many people said the American way of life will go down and under if we take these guys seriously. But they were taken seriously. Secondly, we got a citizens' movement to put pressure on pol politicians and political leaders saying, we don't, need, we don't want to live this any longer. We don't want next generation, my sons and daughters, uh, to be uh, uh, threatened by skin cancer. Thirdly, political leaders came together. And let's remind ourselves, it was, these were not green radicals. This was Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, was the most important conservative leaders of the time, but they took science and citizens seriously, and they decided to act, and they decided to act together, not separately, but together. Fourthly, uh, we implemented it. We took implementation very seriously. We had fantastic people like Tina, uh, like the people in Montreal doing the, and Tina is the head of the <laughs> of our Ozone Secretariat. Uh, the people in Montreal at the, at the Global Fund there, people who really made sure that we implemented the deal. And finally, we left it to the private sector to find the practical technical solutions which we needed, which government are not good at, but which private sector nearly always fi uh, find if they are uh, directed by the right market signals. So this is the textbook example as what we need to do. Then we are following up under great leadership from Rwanda in Kigali. Again, everyone came to get together, overcome differences, and, and the Rwanda and other leadership uh, find this agreement. I'm now going around the world telling every nation you need to ratify it. Not one nation has said no. Most nations have said, either like Edgar and Catherine, that we are already in the process of doing it, doing it so give us a little bit of time to get it right or they said, we will start that process. No one has said, no, we don't want to do it. So for sure it will happen, and I'm absolutely confident that with the same uh, mechanisms like in Montreal, we'll be as successful on, on Kigali, and thus reduce global warming by half uh, a degree. Again, great success. Then finally, the next step after Montreal and Kigali, that is a global coalition for clean cooling. Uh, John, you, men you mentioned it. There may be another half degree which we can gain for more uh, energy efficiency in air conditioning. And if I may add, this is not just a matter of environment. This is also a matter of health and well-being. The biggest singular killing during the, uh, uh, the hurricane in the United States were eight old people dying in Florida in an old people's home because the air conditioning was cut. Simply was so hot that they couldn't, couldn't survive. So air conditioning is a matter of life and death for people, and for sure a huge matter of well-being. In northern India, where most people still do not have air conditioning, goes up to 45, even 50 degrees in summer. Uh, every person there wants air conditioning, as every person back home in Norway wants heating. So providing air conditioning well be is well-being, is health, but it's environment, and we need to do it in a much more energy-efficient way. Technology is there to be explored. I'm absolutely confident, again, if we as politicians give the direction, the private sector and the market will find the technical solutions for this to happen. We are on the way, but we'll just need to go all the way. So again, congratulations to all of you, both with Montreal. We'll celebrate, hopefully, in Montreal later in the year. Thank you for Kigali, and let's uh, take this for forward. Thank you very much, Eric. I turn now to the UNDP Administrator, Mr. Akim Steiner. Thank you, Johnson Ministers. Um, my dear colleagues, and I can't resist President of UNEA. What a wonderful title. <laughs> um, you have said it all, so really my, my role to be here tonight is, is just twofold. One, to, to echo what has been said. Um, both in terms of the significance, and Eric, thank you for, for reminding us of, of the, the, the story, the chronology of, of, the, of the protocol, but also now of the, of the amendment. And um, I know that before Paris, 
we were looking at this as reversing the traditional Paris to Africa rally. It was supposed to be a from Africa to Paris rally, it then took one more loop and became a Paris to Kigali rally, to borrow the analogy for a moment. But extraordinarily in that night, you, you did something that truly was another one of those moments where people who are often accused of being bureaucrats or national negotiators who don't care, um, made those calls that you just spoke to, Minister. And I think that speaks to one of the things that is unique about this, this particular community. It's made up of such different people, from science, from politics, from the private sector, from civil society, and yet it's almost like a fraternity that has carried this, this protocol and, and its work along, allowed it to evolve with, with new science emerging. And I think that's one of the things also. It, this is a dynamic agreement that can actually grow, evolve, take new science into account, bring new solutions to bear. And maybe just one aspect that I think also explains the, the the element that you pointed to, Eric, just now, I think we should not underestimate how important it is to conceive of a negotiating process as not something that only has to do with breaking the positions of one side or the other. And that's why you have two people sitting here, Johnson and Tina, who, and I witnessed this <coughs> over a three-year period, designed the most extraordinarily detailed environmental diplomacy roadmap that I have ever seen in terms of actually thinking about every single party to this agreement and where they stood and where they needed to get to and also what needed to happen in order for them not to leave again. And that is also part of combining the best of multilateralism. And I was reminded when you spoke just now that there is a reason why these treaties are made under the auspices of the United Nations because sometimes the smallest nations on earth can achieve the greatest things for humanity because they work through the United Nations and because in this building here, it doesn't matter how big you are, at the end of the day it is whether you're right in terms of the interests of the collective. And I think this is something that we should talk about more. In that skepticism, that cynicism that so often is projected onto the public about multilateralism, how often in one day could you actually say if it hadn't been for the United Nations providing a meeting ground, we would not have what we have today, right down to connectivity and letters reaching us across the world and planes being able to fly across <coughs> national boundaries. So it's a story about, as you say, a fantastic treaty, but also multilateralism at its best. And let me just end, because that was my other part, obviously in my new capacity as administrator of UNDP, I'm not only delighted to have a, an excuse and a reason to continue to be part of this family, but we're very proud as an institution for many years already as an implementing agency in association also with the multilateral fund, but most importantly, alongside our partner countries to help make the most out of this agreement and now the Kigali Amendment when you guys get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akim. I turn now to Dr. Tina Grimpilli, Executive Secretary of the UN Ozone Secretariat. Thank you, John. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank uh, both governments of Rwanda and Canada for organizing this high-level event, encouraging parties to the Montreal Protocol to ratify the Kigali Amendment. Many arguments urging ratification have already been heard and it's always difficult to, to find a different angle to make the same case. The objective is to have 20 parties ratifying the Kigali Amendment for the Kigali Amendment to enter into force. But I would say that for the Secretariat, the ultimate objective is the universal ratification, as has always been the tradition of the Montreal Protocol. So in many interactions that I have with governments around the world, uh, many times I hear the same question. Why are you encouraging countries to ratify now since the Kigali Amendment will enter into force only in 2019 and since the control measures for developing countries will kick in much later, in 2024 and in 2029? And the response for me is one. The implementation of Kigali has to be firmly grounded in the principles that underline the Montreal Protocol, especially that of equity, to ensure that all developing countries are empowered to comply with their legal obligations through the assistance of the multilateral fund. 
And empowering does not mean relying on the financial assistance that will come from the fund. It is ensuring that this assistance is being used at national level for technology transfer, for improved skills, and for maintaining jobs that otherwise may have been lost, especially in the servicing sector, ensuring that it opens up the market for the developing producing countries to have a bigger market niche worldwide. With the adoption of the Kigali Amendment, the countries of the world gave clear signals to the chemical and manufacturing industries for investment and innovation in the growing cooling sector. It is with the widest and earliest ratification of the Kigali Amendment where this international regulation, once it is adopted at the national level, will nurture the national markets and will enhance competition globally. And this is why I'm honored to head an environmental secretariat whose impact is much broader than the environment and which has showed in the world community another example of the critical and irreplaceable role of the United Nations. That the solid yet flexible foundation, as you've said, Minister, we can improve the amendment as time goes by, has been based on a forum where governments, industry, non-governmental organizations, scientists are all brought together thanks to the United Nations and all these actors can work in partnership. Finally, as it has already been said, 2017 marks the 30th anniversary of the protocol's life. And there is no better way to celebrate this anniversary by seeking country support to ratify the Kigali Amendment and build on the next 30 years. You as ministers, leaders of the United Nations Environmental Assembly, and I, 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 I get that as a promise that you could convey the message to, to the ministers in your forum. Leaders of the United Nations General Assembly are the binding force to bring coherence among the different, sometimes in silo, uh, United Nations fora in addressing all environmental issues and bring the Montreal Protocol to its new phase under its new mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I should note, as, as uh, Akin mentioned, I had the privilege to work for the past few years in the margins, trying to assist as we could, uh, working very closely with many of you. Uh, and I have to say that I, some of the leadership that was key and instrumental came from Tina and her team to really work with all of the groups here to, to ensure that everyone was looking to the prize ahead and, and never forgot the important goal that we're working on. And I just would make, if you'll forgive me a side note, that uh, many of you may not know that the Montreal Protocol and the Ozone Secretariat has a new collaboration with Marvel Comics. And I'm gonna put you on the spot, Tina, just to take a minute, uh, which emphasizes individual power that we each have and how working effectively can help pr protect the ozone. So the, I'll turn over to the superhero, Tina, for one, one comment on this, yeah? who has uh, taken the team that we had we had a, actually an incredible lunch on um, on Friday and I'm very thankful to to Catherine McKenna but also to Commissioner Cañete and actually we had the pleasure of having the special envoy from China on climate change I think it was a fantastic event and basically what I would like to say it's not we have the Marvel comics because my son doesn't know anything about ozone depletion and he's my inspiration but I think the the thing is that you don't need these superpowers to achieve results you need human human characteristics that collectively together can bring uh, the impossible possible can make the impossible possible and I think this is the message of the campaign but in any case please take the quiz and find out your superpower <laughs> thank you very much we have a few minutes uh, for some questions and maybe what I'd like to do is kick off with some questions first uh, to the ministers and then maybe to the implementing uh, partners as well uh, to the ministers uh, and some of you have touched on this as well. But <clears throat> again, for those who are wondering, why is it so important for all the countries to ratify the Kigali Amendment right away, 
given, as Tina just mentioned, it can't come into force until January 1, 2019, and that most developing countries won't need to meet targets till January 1, 2024. So for the ministers, how would you address that question? Let me take first the panelist ministers first, and then, <laughs> then we'll shift the question, yes. Uh, so I spent a lot of time talking about how the environment and the economy go together. Um, and I think this is, it's really critical because we need to provide certainty to the market. We need to provide certainty to business. Uh, we've talked a lot about when I was, uh, when, when we were in the negotiations about the challenges. We maybe don't have all the technologies. Um, but one thing you know is that businesses, when, they, when the business community sees an opportunity, they will help, they will figure it out. So we have to be very clear that we are committed, that there is an opportunity, that countries are moving forward, that it's coming to force, and, and they, will, they will help solve it. Um, and we saw that with the Montreal Protocol where there were some concerns, you know, was the business community going to be there, were there going to be the innovations, and it worked. And so I think providing certainty is so key. That's why my other topic I like talking about is putting a price on pollution generally, provides certainty to, to industry, and it creates the right incentives. And this is about sending the, the right message um, and creating the right incentives. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Ministers of Environment and, and Climate Change of Canada, uh, Honorable uh, Catherine uh, McKenna, and also the Minister from Rwanda, Dr. Vincent Puruta, for hosting this important uh, meeting. Um, uh, uh, as uh, just now uh, Eric said, for us small island states, uh, uh, it, it has been very important, and uh, for all, it's uh, most one of the most successful treaties is uh, uh, the uh, uh, Montreal Protocol, and uh, uh, that is the reason why we should actually have to have uh, climate addressed uh, uh, with an amendment in this uh, Montreal Protocol. Some of the important things for us as a, a, a small island states, uh, especially Maldives, is uh, we are we we very much depend on fisheries and fishing, and the, when when we are talking about uh, the amendment, we need to uh, have the technology in place to make sure that the uh, the new uh, uh, refrigerant, uh, because now we, ma we are very much dependent on CFCs, uh, which is uh, a, a very high uh, 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 GH, uh, 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 very high global, uh, uh, which is not very good for the uh, uh, climate uh, change. So we need to have more uh, uh, technology in place to make sure that once we ratify this uh, agreement that we, we can actually service our uh, industries like fishing and also the uh, air conditioners that we just talked. So that's something that we, we would like to see uh, happen soon. But we are uh, on course, uh, especially Maldives, we are on course of getting ratified once the local processes are done. But that is something that we are very much, uh, uh, we want to get the uh, investors and all the uh, industries start working on to see how we can actually change the existing uh, technologies to the new technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'll ask you, uh, thank you for your comments and for questions. I'll ask if we can keep them uh, short so that we can get something and we have maybe five or ten minutes left and then we need to wrap up. Thank you. <clears throat> to go Mexico. Uh, are you hear me? Yeah. Mexico sent our uh, intention to ratify immediately the, the this amendment. Now we are finished uh, all the technical uh, documents that are uh, needed uh, uh, for the Congress to ratify it. Uh, the amendment, uh, and we will expect that in the first quarter of 2018, we will ratify uh, this Kigali uh, very relevant amendment. But let me tell you that Mexico embraced immediately the uh, Montreal Protocol because uh, one of our distinguished, perhaps the most distinguished scientist in Mexico, Dr. Mario Molina, who discovered the ozone hole, in fact, and received the Nobel Prize, no, was pushing a lot 
to change this uh, uh, problem or, uh, in the world, but especially in our country. We know that the Montreal Protocol uh, did or gave us 10 years of the lay of the global, global warming process. But it is, it is true that we can do more after we ratified and the Kigali uh, Amendment, we can increase our ambition because there is a lot of, or there are a lot of technologies that we can use in order to really phase out all these HFCs gases that we are using for air conditioning. Let me just give you two examples. All light duty vehicles that we are using right now are using HFCs. And we have the, the not no Mexico, but I mean the world has the, the solution for that. And we need to establish regulations for new vehicles in order to replace those gases in the automobile industry. But also we can retrofit them. We can also retrofit all air conditioners in our houses using geothermal heat pumps. So it is needed to increase our ambition, uh, not only to uh, uh, ratify the Kigali Amendment. Thank you. Th thank you very much. And, and now you're on record. Early 2018, we'll be watching. <laughs> uh, we have a, we'll ask again to keep the comments short, concise. We have one down here. Then we go to Mr. Hulot. Thank you. I'm the Minister for Climate and Environment of Norway. I actually got uh, encouraged by the question from uh, the Maldives to give a response to the question rather than pose a question. Uh, the technology you ask for does exist. There's a, and, and I'm proud to market Norwegian solutions here, of course. Um, there's a technology world leading using CO2 as an agent, uh, cooling agent, instead of um, HFCs freezing the fish on fishing vessels 50% faster than the old technology. So much so that German supermarkets insist on fish from that particular, those particular vessels because it's also of higher quality. So it's a win-win-win-win situation. Otherwise, let me just say that all that needs to be said has been said. Um, it has even been said from by others that Norway has ratified, but I can't avoid taking advantage of the invitation to tease Catherine's competitive nature. Uh, so let me state it for the record that Norway is proud to have ratified last week. Thank you. Thank you very much. And who knew frozen fish could be such a positive thing? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hulot. Uh, Just to make a few, uh, a small comment regarding your question. In my climate plan, I announced that starting in 2014, in my country, we would ban all thermic matters. Why that particular date? To be frank, I don't really know why I chose that date, but it seemed to me to give good prediction for economic actors to integrate this matter. History confirms that constraint is not opposed to creativity. It is needed. So this is just a small contribution I wanted to make. Once you've dealt with constraints, things can work much faster if we know that the rules of the game are not going to stand in the way. Very good. Thank you for that reminder. Maybe I'll throw one question out to the implementing partners, and that is, how does the Kigali Amendment contribute to and affect the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, I'm not looking at anyone in particular, Eric and Akim, so whoever chooses to dive into that one. <laughs> uh. Offer just two thoughts. Um, it fits right in it um, <clears throat> because it is a classic example of how an agreement that may have an imperative or an immediate driver rooted, first of all, in a singular objective produces multiple benefits. And I think that is one of the DNA elements of the SDGs. And therefore, just from that perspective, it fits in. Secondly, it also 
helps us to transition towards a kind of economy that has now become the job title, actually, of Nicolas Hulot, and, and I think the ideas that are driving change. And I just want to amplify one more aspect, which economic, not just theory, but actually business schools are now teaching us, that for a transition to happen, for an innovation to take root, you don't have to wait until 40 or 50 percent of the actors or the market get there. The interesting thing we see is that actually if 10 or 15 percent of the market begins to use something, that is essentially where the curve takes off. And this is also the explanation why every time in the last 30, 40, 50 years, when we have acted, whether nationally or internationally, on eliminating a substance, it was far cheaper than anybody ever predicted or wanted the public to believe it to be otherwise, and secondly, much faster than was ever thought possible. So it's also a reason why Kigali, and let me say this because it's, um, it's a very personal view, is so important because the world of science, and therefore increasing the public, is beginning to lose faith that the Paris Agreement, or at least the pace on which we are moving right now, can still deliver to us a two degree below two degree world. The window is closing very fast. I just spent the last year in Oxford, uh, surrounded by climate scientists, and I challenge them. How can you say we cannot make it? You, your assumptions are not rooted in science. They're rooted in an interpretation of society's inertia rather than anything else. But Kigali is critical because it will, first of all, give us some degree of extra leverage, and it will help us to accelerate, actually, the ambition in the Paris Agreement if it works. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just, uh, seeing no other hands, I will close here and then give, uh, Catherine asked, has asked for a moment at the end. I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists today for your strong action to help reduce HFCs and ratify the Kigali Amendment. Your reminder of the attention and urgency needed toward the implementation calls attention to the important work ahead. While the journey may be long, it begins with small and deliberate steps, many of which are already being taken by countries here, as we have heard. Together, I'm confident we can achieve our overarching goal to better care for our environment and our planet. All of you are part of those efforts to protect our planet and its people, and I thank you for what you do to realize the principles in the UN Charter and embody the spirit of international cooperation and contribute to a better world. And with that, I give the last word to one of our co-hosts who's asked for it. Well, thank you very much, Johnson. And thank you to all of you who are here. It's funny when I think about when I was young, I also always wondered what it was like at the UN. Um, and uh, it really is incredible. I, I, I really do want to recognize uh, Tina and the UN Ozone Secretariat and all our friends in Montreal. Please thank them for all the work uh, for the UN, for, for uh, Eric, Akim, Edgar. It's really important. Multilateralism matters more than ever. Um, bipartisanship matters more than ever. So I want to recognize that we have Linda Duncan, who's from a different political party in Canada, but she also cares greatly about the environment. And I think it's just better when we do things together. And the last thing I, 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 I want to say, and maybe this will also be an inspiration um, to us, I, it was really sad this year um, when we had two heroes, climate change heroes, pass away from the Marshall Islands. Um, so maybe it's in their name um, that we think about how important it is, the work that they do. Um, we had two heroes who worked tirelessly um, to get an ambitious uh, Paris Agreement, who also worked extraordinarily hard on the Montreal Protocol. Um, and I know that they would be really happy uh, to, to see us here today. Um, and uh, I think that their legacy will inspire, and maybe for them, uh, we can also just, uh, you know, in Montreal when we celebrate, we will also remember them and their hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we're adjourned.